Thank you. How do people transform? There have always been a few things that I'm passionate and curious about. In fact, I see these three things as three vertexes of a triangle. The first vertex is people. Why do people do the things they do? And what prompts us, you and I, to take certain actions and decisions? The second vertex is leadership. How are some leaders able to maintain their calm and balance and composure, even in the most trying situations, while others falter and fail? The third vertex of the triangle is management. How are some companies able to succeed and sustain, while others may spike up, but eventually fail and falter? I've been fortunate to have a career as a management consultant, to sit right in the middle of this triangle, and actually observe all the three vertexes, and even see how they influence each other. I help people and organizations transform. But wait, what is transformation? I mean, when you enroll into a gym, they promise transformation. When you enter a philosophy class, you promise transformation. <laughs> For the purpose of this talk, I'm defining transformation as moving from a current state of being with respect to how you are able to respond to life, problems, situations, setbacks, to an elevated state of being from which your response is more mature. Movement from a current state of being to a more elevated state of being from which you cannot revert. Because if you revert, it could be a stroke of genius or a stroke of luck. How do you make it sustainable transformation? And that's what we people and organizations strive, doesn't it? And in my observation of successful people and organizations who've actually transformed, I have seen a clear pattern of behaviors, and today I'm going to talk about the bedrock of what constitutes transformation. The most important characteristic seems to be the ability to see things in perspective. You see, most often we people either over-exaggerate a very simple problem into a monster, and then our reactions are never optimized, or we sometimes under-exaggerate a potentially big problem and therefore treat it as everyday issue. The ability to see things in perspective and therefore cut the problem to its right size is indeed a skill. Now some of you may say, Aditya, you know what, I'm able to do that. And you know what, you are right. But it becomes very difficult when it happens to yourself. Let me prove it to you. Now imagine your best friend is going through a personal problem. Say, he's failed in an exam or failed at work, or he's broken up in a relationship, or use your creative juices to think of a problem. It's after all your friend who's going through it. <laughs> now, apparently, he's devastated, distracted, destructed. Now as a good friend, you want to make him feel better. So you take him aside, sit him down, and what would be your advice to him? Just take a few seconds, what would you tell him? Well, you may tell him if he's failed an exam, you may tell him, it's after all an exam. This is not even such an important subject. Three years later, looking back, you didn't even bother about it. You're so talented in so many other things, so don't fret over this. One of these responses, yeah? Suppose he's broken up in a relationship. What would you tell him now? Dude, there are so many people out there waiting for you, as if you know. <laughs> the world is a larger place than this. Why are you crying over this? You know what? You're destined for a much better future than that person. In both the cases, what you've tried to do is you're able to see things in perspective that he can't. And you're trying to transfer this perspective to the other person. In both cases, you're asking him to take a chill pill. But for a moment, he sees a halo behind your head. But he continues to be agitated till the natural cause of events gets him out of it, isn't it? Now, suppose three months later, one of this happens to you. Or don't go in search of it, but if it happens to you, how would you react to the situation? 
Mm. Okay, devastated, distracted, destructed, and more D's than that. <laughs> now, was the issue the lack of knowledge of the right response to the situation? Apparently not. Case in point, you knew exactly what to tell your friend to respond to such a situation. There seems to be a gap between what we know as right and our ability to apply it to ourselves. Isn't there? There seems to be a gap in terms of seeing things in perspective for the world out there and seeing things in perspective when something happens to ourselves. Isn't it? We're all guilty of that, aren't we? Because when you're advising another person, you're putting the spotlight on the knowledge itself. So knowledge is unbound, unconstrained, free-flowing. But when something happens to you, the spotlight is on myself. And therefore, the knowledge doesn't creep in through the crevices and cracks and curves of my own personality. And I'm trapped by my own ego and personality. There are two profound thoughts that come out of this. One, all knowledge that you ever require to respond to life's issues, problems, situations are already inside you. And how do you know that? Just imagine your friend is going through that and ask yourself, what would you tell him? And number two, all the knowledge that you possess seem to fail you when it comes to yourself. But unfortunately, when we are faced with a setback, we go run behind more knowledge. My friend invited me to his house to show me his collection of self-help books. <laughs> we watch more videos, read more books, speak to more people. But the question is, is our everyday life truly becoming better as a result of this process? Probably not. How are some people, some successful people, able to marry knowledge with application to themselves? How are some people able to convert this knowledge into wisdom? When I zoom in and look at these successful people, over the course of many years, I realize that these people are always have a high degree of self-awareness. No, not self-awareness in its basic form of knowing my strengths and weaknesses like in an inter interview. <laughs> self-awareness to its highest degree of able to play two roles at the same time. One, the role of the actor, the doer, which is me, I, the personality. Number two, the ability to step out of this personality and look at myself as an observer, as a witness. It's as if there is a CCTV camera right in front of me showing my live footage to me every second of the day. And I'm able to see myself as an observer. And what does it do to me? When I'm the actor, the question that I ask when something happens to me is, why did it happen to me? How do I respond to this bad boss? How do I respond to the situation? But if I'm stepping out of my personality as a witness, the question I ask is, how should a person respond to the situation? How should a person respond to a boss? And it's as if like I'm talking to my friend. And suddenly, it starts to make more sense. In all cultures and philosophies, playing witness is, is both a used and abused concept. But let's leave philosophy aside. How can playing observer, playing witness, help us in our own practical everyday lives? And I'm going to end with three specific utilities of playing witness. Number one, playing witness allows you to do the test of uniqueness of the problem or situation you're in. You see, when you're the actor, every problem that you face seems very unique to you. The entire world and universe is conspiring just for you, against you. When you play the witness, you're able to test for uniqueness and able to cut things down to size. Let me give you an example. I was working, consulting an organization recently. And there were two managers in that organization who had joined probably a year ago. One of them 
was an average performer. And he didn't have a great network within the organization. The other one had already become a superstar performer. And everybody had great things to say about him. Now, I first went and met the average performer. And I asked him, what were the roadblocks that this allowed him to perform great in the organization? And this is what he said. He said, Aditya, there is so much politics in this organization. And I'm always unlucky where there is politics. You see, there is grape wine, there is corridor conversations, people are forming cliques against me, there is lack of transparency in processes, and that's not allowing me to perform well. Well, I felt his pain, but I was more curious now to speak to the other guy, because he was in the same organization, the same processes, and the same culture, same politics. How did he do well? So I asked him, so how have you been able to navigate through the politics? And he looked at me and smiled, and he asked, Aditya, you're a consultant, so you must be privy to many organizations. Has there been any organization you've worked with where politics hasn't been a complaint? Well, I thought of it, and I had to confess that if there are two, three common problems I see of all organizations, institutions, NGOs, one of it is always, ah, oh, there is politics here. <laughs> so I confess, saying, you know what, no, it seems to be a common problem. He continued, he said, exactly. He said, wherever there are more than two people, politics exists. So this is neither unique to me, nor unique to this organization. So I realized when I joined this organization that the problem is normal. I had to find my way around the organizations through the politics and still be my best self. Ah, see what he had done? The first guy restricted himself to play only the actor and therefore Ask the question, why is it happening to me? This guy was able to step out of his personality and view the problem as a witness and therefore understand there's nothing unique about this and he had to find a way around it. And that's what playing witness does. It helps you see things in perspective to marry knowledge and application when it comes to yourself. The second utility of playing witness is the ability to See yourself in multiple situations and draw an insight that could help you. Let me give you an example. 15 years ago, when I started speaking on stage, I was a nervous wreck with any new audience. And slowly, when it happened two, three times, I realized that I'm a guy with, who lacks confidence. I even labeled myself as a person who lacked confidence. When this happened often, I went to my mentor and asked her, what do I do? I don't think I'm cut out for going on stage and speaking to audiences. Now, she said something very interesting. She didn't give me an advice. She said, Aditya, observe yourself in multiple situations. You may find your own answer. I started doing that. And I realized something very interesting. Well, in the dining table with my parents or with friends, I was confident in school and college. I was very confident. In fact, I talked too much. Even with strangers in a hotel or in a cab, I was pretty articulate and confident. So being confident was my natural state of being. Nervousness on stage was the exception, was the aberration. I was able to see that insight that I was considering my audience as hostile. If I had befriended them, like I befriend family, friends, or anybody I meet in the road, probably my nervousness would die. And it did. And I've never been nervous in front of an audience after that. The ability to step outside your personality and view yourself in multiple situations and draw an insight from there. But playing an actor makes you label yourself by exaggerating one situation out of many that you happen to face at the moment. The last and final utility of playing witness that I'm going to end this presentation with is playing witness, that is stepping outside your own personality and observing yourself, allows you to watch the canvas of your own life and draw amazing insights from it. Let me ask you, when you were five or 10, what was your biggest worry in life? <laughs> well, not wealth management, right? <laughs> it could be toys, uh, probably uh, uh, video games, 
If someone took your favorite toy, you would probably cry, lock yourself up in a room, or probably not eat your lunch or dinner, give your parents a hard time for sure. Now, 10 years after that, when you were 15 or 20, if I took your toy, what would you do? You say, can you take everything, please? <laughs> <I need to. laughs> it happens to be a no problem. <laughs> right? What was so passionate, what you lost sleep over at one point, just five or ten years later, seems to be a good riddance <laughs> to your toys. But you know what? At 15, you had other problems. That manifested as big in your head as toys did to you when you were five. And here, you're not able to see that in as perspective as you're able to see the toys when you're 50. When you're 25, how would you look at what you did at 15 and react? You're like, ah, why did I over-exaggerate that? I lost days and days just sitting in my house, locking myself in the room for what? Crying over what? It's not worth it. In fact, you would advise your 15-year-old cousin or friend or somebody that way. Now, this goes on and on and on. Now, if I ask you, what is that problem, or what are you losing sleep over at the moment? They would tell me, Aditya, all of this is right, but the problem I'm facing now is very real. <laughs> now, this is true. All of it I agree, but now is always real. Now, 10 years later, what would your future self look at your biggest problem at the moment and ask you to do? That you are able to look at your five-year-old self and advice. Now, if you're able to step outside your personality, the canvas of life enables you to do that. And that's freedom, that's empowerment. You feel in control. And therefore, you're able to marry knowledge which we all possess in abundance, case point, advising your friend, <laughs> to application. And that's conversion of knowledge to wisdom. To summarize, how do people transform from moving from a current state of being in terms of responding to what life throws at you to an elevated state of being with respect to how you respond to life? And one of the key characteristics seems to be the ability to see things in perspective, which is very simple when it happens to the world, but becomes complicated when it's happening to yourself. The ability to play two roles, that of the doer and the witness at the same time, gives you that opportunity to view yourself as your friend and ask the question, what should this guy do in this situation? Instead of what should I do in this situation? And that helps you see things in perspective and gives you a great bedrock for personal transformation. Thank you. Thank you.